In this lecture, we are going to cover the new AP Psych FRQ format for the academic year 2024 to 2025. So I've compiled some data together based on what the College Board has provided. And in that data, we know that the new exam format is going to be 75 multiple choice questions with answer choices A, B, C, and D. So no longer five answer choices, but instead just four. And this is going to be in one hour and 30 minutes. Okay, this makes up about two-thirds of your score. This is going to be very vocabulary heavy. So you're going to need approximately 500 vocab terms over the course of the year as we address the different units, units one through five, as well as unit zero, which deals with scientific practices like research methods and ethics and statistics. For the free response questions, you have two questions for 70 minutes, so one hour and 10 minutes, and these FRQs are going to be worth the same number of points. Each one is worth seven points. But we see now that they're basing this more on a document-based question, analyzing sources. So for free response question one, that is an AAQ, or an article analysis question, with one document. With the EBQ, that's an evidence-based question, with three documents, plus you'll be asked to bring in information from the content that you covered. So just a brief overview of what this is going to entail. For the AAQ, you have one document and you are going to have 10 minutes to read the document. That means that you'll have approximately 15 minutes to write. So you have 25 minutes total, 10 minutes of that reading, and that is going to be comprised of what we call unit zero, what used to be unit one in the old AP Psychology CED course and exam description. So this is going to involve information from scientific practices, hence why we do a whole unit zero before getting to unit one with the brain and neuroanatomy. So with this, you're going to have seven points, A through F, and you should make your best effort to answer all of them, even if it's a guess. You only have points taken away if the information that you provide contradicts the actual answer and your own answer. So with research method, you have two options. You have experimental and non-experimental. The experimental method involves an independent variable and a dependent variable where you're manipulating and then measuring the effects. So experimental deals with causation. The non-experimental can include things like meta-analysis, case studies, naturalistic observations, or longitudinal studies. Where you notice they're not in a lab or controlled setting, so there's no independent or dependent variable. So once you identify if it's experimental or non-experimental, with the experimental method, you don't need to go any further. You could just say the research method utilized in this study was experimental. If you say non-experimental, you will have to elaborate on what exactly that means. Is it a meta-analysis? Is it a case study? You should also note that survey is not considered a research method. A survey is a technique. So that could be one of your operational definitions as it relates to identifying how you measure your independent variable and dependent variable, you could put a survey in or a Likert scale or some kind of diagnostic test, okay, but it's not going to be an actual method. Research variable deals with the operational definitions. So if it asks you to identify the independent variable, then you would identify that. If it's the dependent variable, then you identify that. If it asks you to identify the population or the sample or the operational definition, like how do you specifically measure happiness or sadness or memory, okay, that would be a part of the research variable. Then with statistical interpretation, they may ask you about differences between the means in the different measurements that you take. They may ask what's the standard deviation show. So like if you were doing a study on IQ, then you might say that uh, the someone who scored 
two standard deviations below the mean has a percentile rank of 2%, meaning that 98 or so percent of the population involved in this test or in this study scored higher than that individual. So while you may not be required to actually calculate a mean, median, mode, or a standard deviation, you are responsible for knowing what they mean and how they relate to the data so you can interpret the data accurately. With ethical guidelines, that could involve things like informed consent, debriefing, the ethical use of deception. It could involve using confederates, uh, or it could involve the reduction of harm. So is the result that we get from this study worth any potential side effects or damage? Okay, anything that the Institutional Review Board would look at prior to approving a study, it would fall under the ethical guidelines. With generalize, generalizability of the study, and this is looking at to whom the results could apply. So if you do a study on the eating habits of teenagers, like do boys eat more than girls or vice versa, then your total population of teenagers would be who it's generaliz generalizable to. You could say since the study looks at uh, female teens and male teens, it's generalize generalizable to female uh, teens and male teens. You couldn't say that it's generalizable to people, right? That's too broad. You can't say that it's generalizable to geriatric because that's not true. They didn't study any geriatrics. Okay, they were looking specifically at teenagers. So if they're studying babies or they're studying teenagers or they're studying older populations or just people with schizophrenia or people who've had a stroke or have had cancer, okay, that's going to be who you can apply these results to. For argument and application, this is where you are going to use results from the document, from the study, to explain how the results support or refute the initial hypothesis. If you only cite the results, but you don't actually explain how it supports or refutes, then you only get one point. Or if you explain that it is supported or it is refuted, but you don't explain how or why, then you don't get a point. You have to use both the results from the document as well as explain how it refutes or supports the hypothesis. So the results have to be used accurately. You have to be able to interpret them accurately. For instance, if you say that the case study shows causation, well, non-experimental method cannot show causation. Only experimental method can do that. So it does have to be accurate. With regards to the second FRQ, or the evidence-based question, with this one, you are provided three documents. Since you have three documents, you have more time to read, 15 minutes. And some of them are shorter than others, okay, so you can fit them into that 15-minute period. That means you have 30 minutes remaining to write for a total of 45 minutes. So you add both these questions together, 25 minutes plus 45 minutes, that gives you the total 70 minutes. With this, they're focusing on the units in the CED. So anything from units one through five are fair game for the EBQ. With this, you're going to provide a claim based on the evidence that you read. Then you're going to provide two sources and how those sources support that claim. So this is where you'll use results from the actual studies that you've looked over, the three documents, to support the claim that you made. And then you also have to provide reasoning justifying the evidence. So how does document B or document C or the mean or the standard deviation support the claim, as well as apply some outside evidence? This means any of the vocabulary that you've covered in class that's not directly mentioned in the documents can be used as supporting evidence. So this is where your own knowledge of the content is going to come into play. So how I explain this to my students is I use the mnemonic device T-E-A. For T, you're making a claim or a thesis. So if it's studying the effects of video games, 
on young teenagers. In reading the documents, it supports a claim that excess video game use higher than 30 hours a week results in lowered attention span in teens. That would be a claim based on the documents that you read. Then you have to provide evidence in the form of documents and in the form of your outside knowledge. So I call this specific factual information, okay, vocabulary terms, proper nouns, or the names for things, and then an explanation of them. Your analysis is when you explain. You justify your claim using that evidence. For each document that you use, you should have a piece of outside SFI, something that is not found in the sources that are provided. So you are going to need two documents. Therefore, you need two pieces of content from your lectures in order to answer this section. So just some general guidelines that are applicable for the FRQs. You should read and annotate the articles before you write. This is where you're going to want to brainstorm. Write down any vocabulary terms that you recall that could be applied. You may want to go ahead and start identifying the population or the sample or the variables. You may want to look at any of the claims that are being made, specifically in the results. Okay, was their hypothesis supported or was it not supported? You also want to answer all parts of the question. If it asks you for what the difference in the mean represents, then don't talk about the standard deviation just because you know about the standard deviation. You have to answer about that specific question. So like if a study is measuring two variables, only cover the variable that the question asks for. You don't gain any extra points for additional information. You don't lose any points as long as you don't contradict what you were saying. You should also use complete sentences. If it asks you for what the independent variable is, don't just say the definition of it. Like an independent variable is what the researchers manipulate in order to see if there's a cause and effect relationship. Say that it's the medicine that is given. Say that it is the amount of TV that is watched. Whatever they are using in order to manipulate the environment to see the effects that it has on the dependent variable. You also don't need to write a full-blown essay. This is not a five-paragraph essay. You just need to answer the question. If that requires one sentence, then, then answer it with one sentence. If it requires two sentences, then you do you. Just make sure that you're concise and you're not trying to do context, thesis, and all of that. Only answer what the question wants. So specifically with the EBQ, I use the format of TEA. You make the topic sentence or the claim. For instance, the relationship between TV time and GPA, if they're trying to study whether or not they have a causal relationship between an increased number of hours watching TV and then a decreased GPA, then that's the claim. Then you need evidence to back that up. With the documents, you do need to cite your answers. So you can do that parenthetically or in text. You also need to provide outside evidence. And don't just name drop vocabulary. Actually explain how it relates to your answer. Then lastly, with A, that's when you're going to apply and justify. So not just saying whether or not the hypothesis was supported, but how it was supported. Interpret the results accurately. Task verbs that are used in the AP psychology free response questions include describe, explain, identify, propose, support, refute, and use evidence. The use evidence is always going to be relevant to your FRQs. If it asks for just identify or state, it's important to note that you do not need to give like three sentences explanation. With that, you just identify what it's asking for and you move on. If it asks you what the dependent variable is, you just say in a complete sentence, the dependent variable is the effect on GPA or the score on the test or the survey results indicating levels of happiness or levels of focus. Okay, whatever the documents give you, 
that's where you're going to be able to find the answer. When it says to describe or explain, support, refute, use evidence, that's when you're going to have to be more specific, using your reasoning to support your claim. doesn't necessarily have to be more than one sentence, but there is no real limit to what you can write. It is going to be a digital exam, and so you're not going to be limited in space as much as you might have been during a written exam. So you may have been wondering why Unit 0 was covered in class for the first couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending on your schedule. And it's because even though it's not technically a unit in the CED, it is going to be applied throughout every unit that we cover. So this is the foundational information, and it is actually going to make up the first FRQ. The AAQ is going to ask you about all of those different relevant aspects of Unit 0. For instance, the research method is in an experiment or non-experiment. That is worth one point. So you're going to need to know the difference between causation and correlation. You're going to need to know what is a case study versus a naturalistic observation. If it manipulates the variables, right, that's going to be more of an experiment because experiments can show causation. If he doesn't show causation or there's no manipulation, you're just observing or you're reporting on an event that happened to one person or to an entire group that's very rare, that would be a case study. Then you need to identify the operational definitions. Okay, so what is the independent variable? How do they measure it? What's the dependent variable? How do they measure it? If they're measuring rates of happiness, okay, how are they going to measure something that's so abstract? With statistical interpretation, you may be asked about measures of central tendency, like the mean, median, and mode. It's important to note that the mean as the average is going to be the most commonly used measure of central tendency, with the mode being the least used measure. But the median is often used when there are outliers in the data, so you can get more reliable data from what has been gathered. Then, ethical guidelines. Was it reviewed by the review board? Was there informed consent? Did they sign a sheet of paper saying that they understand the risks and the benefits and so on? Was there protection from harm? Okay, were they debriefed after the experiment or after the observation so that they know exactly what you were studying and know like no animals or people were harmed in the carrying out of this study? Do you maintain confidentiality with your subjects? Okay, all those are going to be important ethical guidelines. Generalizability. Can you apply this to a larger population and to whom? So to what extent, how much could this be applied to a larger population? Remember, you're just working with a sample that is smaller because you can't possibly test that entire population, but you're testing a representative sample so that you can apply it to a larger population. With argumentation, that's where you get two points. The first point is if you can actually cite the result for a claim or claim that it was supported or refuted. That's the bare minimum. If you can not only interpret the documents accurately and the results accurately enough to say the claim was supported or refuted, but you also add in an explanation for how it supports or refutes the hypothesis, that can earn you the second point. 